everybody, and welcome to the North Central Florida chapter of the AITP meeting for September 2018. I'm Don Pazette, stepping in for Stephen Flowers. He couldn't be here this evening. Uh, we are going to jump in. we got a great guest with us here to present tonight. Uh, before we jump into all of that, though, let me just remind everybody that it's creeping towards the end of the year, so our elections are coming up. I want to remind everybody that the, the, the elections are open for nominations right now. If you're interested in serving in one of the North Central Florida chapter uh, officer roles, either as director, president, vice president, treasurer, please you know, submit your name or submit other people's names who you think might be interested in joining. And let me remind everybody that if you're not a member of the AITP, you should definitely look into that. You can certainly find a number of benefits in addition to presentations like these and the chance to network and socialize with other people in the IT industry. There is no substitute for getting out there and meeting people in person and hearing their stories. AITP helps you to do that. But I always encourage people, member or not, make sure you look for your local chapter meetings like ours right here in Gainesville, Florida. They're always welcome to come out and attend. We look forward to having you and your guests here at any time. All right, well, most of you are tuning in because you want to see our presentation. We've got a special guest. We have Mr. Martin Caputer here with us. And he is with Consultancy, based out of Tampa, Florida. Uh, he is a man of many talents. I'll, I'll let you kind of introduce yourself, Martin. But uh, first off, thank you for joining us. We appreciate having you out here. Well, it's a pleasure to be here and an honor. And, you know, as, a, as an AITP member uh, in a chapter like this, we get a chance to meet a lot of great people. Uh, Consultancy, as an organization, is actually a little bit special for us because of our association with CompTIA. They are a CompTIA authorized partner. So if you're looking for somebody who's able to do training and have technical expertise in that area, consultancy is definitely somebody you want to reach out and learn a little more about. So uh, Martin, I think I've probably talked enough on this one. Let's turn it over to you. And, and what are we going to be talking about this evening? Well, the topic tonight is cloud security essentials. And I appreciate your offer to have me introduce myself a little bit more, but there is a very compact, very uh, lot of material here. Uh, Don was skeptical whether I was going to get through it in the right amount of time. So I'm going to get right to it. The only thing that I will add to what Don has said, uh, I also have a role as an AWS partner, a consulting partner. So that, I don't know, my interest in the cloud came before that but uh, it certainly has helped feed it. Well, when you think about cloud, and particularly cloud security, you end up with some questions. You wonder, what are the cloud's major benefits, especially from the security standpoint? There is a term, shared responsibility. What does that mean? Why should I care? And a very key question is, the cloud service provider asserts that they have all of these security features. How do you know that they're effective? How do you learn how to trust your cloud security provider? We're going to go over that, and we're going to throw some spices into the mix because it's necessary to go over some few key terminologies and concepts. I came up with one myself, a strategic sphere, as opposed to stratosphere, strategic security sphere. That's, that's where we're entering right now. So I want to go over four categories of benefits, logical security, contingency planning, cost and performance. But I wanted to go over the security issues first, if you don't mind. The cloud security provider has the ability to have cybersecurity experts. Encryption is always something that is rather vexing for organizations, and increasingly the requirements, particularly from a regulation standpoint, are that encryption be for data at rest, data in transmission, and key management is always a thorny issue. 
How do you stay compliant with so many regulations, especially the ones that deal with computer security? Uh, there's the opportunity for a direct connection. We'll explain that a little bit more. All kinds of neat virtual terms. Virtual private cloud, virtual private network. There is the opportunity for federated single sign-on. Don't expect you to know what that means. We'll go over it. Two-factor authentication. Okay, so let's get started here. What is your company or entity's business? Is it IT? And that's why a lot of, because it's not, a lot of companies say, well, let someone else handle it. For a while there, that was various third-party service providers, but increasingly, it is the cloud. There is the requirement to have security experts on staff. These people are expensive. Raise your hand. Expensive and hard to keep on staff. And you've got to invest a lot in training for them. And this is the business of the cloud security provider, the cloud service provider. So this is what they do. Encryption. Encryption at rest. Many services on the cloud have encryption by default. Cool, nothing to do. It's set up there. You have a choice to encrypt whatever you want. And this, uh, you think of a data center, it's made up of all these different components, different software and hardware pieces, and the cloud, we, we call these services. Each one is a service. And uh, you have a choice of putting these services together. And so you have a choice. There's a standard, standard set of the, uh, the encryption and many other features, and you decide how much further you want to go as that. Now, one of the problems with encryption is that it, uh, I heard this a lot as an IT auditor, oh, it slows down our response time. And the cloud has often answered that. For instance, when you're talking about the idea of HTTPS, SSL and such, uh, instead of having it take the standard computing, you can ha have a separate resource that gives the power to handle the certificate authentication. And that speeds things up considerably. And this is certainly your option. I was had a client, a very large company, and their database administrator was very mad at me because their company policy said, well, for the most sensitive information, it needs to be encrypted. If the data owner chooses, they didn't offer encryption. And the guy said, well, they never ask. And I said, maybe the reason they don't ask is, okay, no, you don't offer it. It should be available. And this gentleman got very, very mad at me. And one of the things they were worried a lot about was key management. And people are always concerned, if I lose the private keys, I may not be able to get at my data. And that's true for the, for the data that you have now and the, the data that you have archived and off, off-site storage. <laughs> and one of the services that's available on the cloud is called Key Management Service. They will manage the keys for you. You say, 
Well, that gives people at the cloud service provider access to our keys. They assure the clients, no, they can't. And we'll talk a little bit more about how you satisfy yourself to that. But a very interesting point is it, for the, uh, mention another uh, certificate sponsor, ISC Squared on their certified cloud security practitioner test says, what is the best practice? And the best practice is for the client to hold the keys. Well, I don't think the answer is that simple because there's always trade-offs with controls. And when you hold the key, you're also holding the risk. So that's an interesting discussion in and of itself. How many people like staying in compliance with regulations? No hands. Oh, we have one hand. Well, that's amazing. Uh, in a typical world, PCI, if you take electronic payments, you must make your, your living doing that. It's like, you know, who likes being an auditor? And then the auditors will raise their hands. <laughs> uh, so with uh, FERPA, if you're an educational institution or a bank that deals with students, you have to keep their data private. High trust is the new term for HIPAA compliance. Uh, FedRAMP is a very interesting system. It's a very interesting program because the federal government through FedRAMP and FISMA has motivated very strongly the federal government and the state and local governments in tow to migrate to the cloud. But in order to do so, you have to be certified as being compliant with FedRAMP standards. We'll go over that a little bit more. This is one of my favorites because FFIEC, I used to be a bank examiner. And that's all under FFIEC. So that's covered there. GDPR. I remember at the beginning of the year, virtually every uh, continuing education program, get ready for GDPR, get ready. And it's there. And everyone's favorite, the Department of Defense. If you are a contractor, you have to comply with the Department of Defense regulations. Well, the really cool thing about the cloud, as far as what the cloud service provider is responsible for, what's in the cloud, they have a separate report for each one of these regulations. And I've only shown a few. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a little bit more idea of that on the next slide. But they have an assessor come in to verify compliance with these various regulations, one at a time. Uh, I won't say we'll keep this vendor neutral. Here is from one of the uh, major cloud service providers. There's a column for US government, for industry, and regional. And the second page is actually much longer. So you see that there are uh, compliance reports for virtually every conceivable regulation. Regional covers international issues, and that is a major problem. The caveat on that that I'll present to you is that that takes care of what's in the cloud, but you still have to worry about compliance within your own operations. It doesn't totally relieve you of responsibility for regulatory compliance but it sure takes a lot of the load off. I want to talk about virtual private cloud, but before I do, I want to talk about what a cloud service provider has without you choosing to have a virtual private cloud. You start out 
with the hardware, be the server. Oh, excuse me. Uh, the hardware, which is the server, the host OS, and then the hypervisor. The hypervisor is what creates the virtual machine. And the moral of the story is these parts of the stack in lower, everything in between that the, is what the CSP manages and is responsible for, we'll get further into that as well. As a matter of fact, as far as hyper goes, hypervisors go, the most cloud service providers will pro provide you two options, a paravirtual hypervisor, which is uh, a software-based one, and there's even a hardware virtual machine. Your choice, how are you gonna have this? Then on top of it, you have your, your own client operating system. I'm going the wrong way, pardon me. So much animation. <clears throat> and on top of your operating system, of course, you'll have your databases, applications, files, and everything like that. This is your responsibility. Now, when we get into the realm of the virtual private cloud, ooh, we're a vendor neutral organization. Let me cover up the AWS there. Uh, the idea here is beyond having the virtual machine per se, uh, which is only for you as one client, you can also set up a virtual private cloud which can include your, uh, your instances in more than one location. This is a fairly common terminology with the cloud service providers that you have availability zones or zones. There would be several in a region. Then there are many, many regions. And so in this situation here, let's just say there's region one. And the, we, we, there may be more than two data centers the, in the availability zones within that region. But your client, you the client, has two. And the idea here is that the entire virtual private cloud covers both your instances in different data centers. And so you, you set up, uh, each one of them can have, in, in each one will have a different subnet. And this is a very simple diagram. I think it's, it's clear to add the fact that you can have, in both of them, you can have private and public virtual private cloud subnets. And the idea here, you think about what kind of security this is going through, it's going to have an internet gateway, then it's going to go to the router level, then it's going to go to a network access control list, and then within each subnet, there will be security groups. So it is going through many different layers of security in order to make this virtual private cloud possible. And, you know, this is a very common terminology of the uh, defense in depth. It's a very good example of defense in depth because you have defense with many different layers to it. How will you be connected to between the, your client site and the cloud service provider. Well, a lot of clients choose to go through the internet. And I, I'm sure you can imagine the many problems that going through the internet causes. One of them is latency, because as we study the internet, we know that it'll choose really strange paths like 
let's say that uh, there's 10,000 miles between two sites, well, it's going to go through 20, maybe 50,000 miles of path to get there. That causes latency. And anywhere along the path, you have the possibility of the data being intercepted. So we see from both a performance and a security perspective, that's not very, that's not very ideal. So instead, we want to set up a direct connection. For instance, a T1 line that goes in between the two organizations. All of a sudden, now you have the low latency and the security. And just for good measure, we're going to go ahead and add a second line for redundancy, which we'll be talking a little bit about. There are many uh, instances here where I'm going to talk about, that's good. What can we do to ratchet it up to make it better? Now, most people think of virtual private network. Oh, that's cool. I've got Wi-Fi in my home and all of that. This is a different kind of virtual private network. This is set up in the direct connection between the client side and the CSP. And being a VPN technology, it's going to use an IPsec tunnel. And that tunnel provides the encryption so that just in case someone was able to get in the middle and trying to intercept that information, it would be encrypted. We're talking about encryption during transmission. I told you I'd explain a little bit about the federation, the Enterprise Identity Federation. I use the term SSO loosely because SSO has a slightly different uh, connotation. The concept is the same. You don't want your user, like in a typical organization, to have, oh, I don't know, I was at a large company. We had 50 different applications that we had to log into. All those passwords. Oh, I think I'm going to start writing them down. I'm going to put little post-it notes on my computer. Not very effective. So within the organization, many organizations have, have gone to using Active Directory, a technology called SAML, the, uh, which is applicable to certain programs, and Web Identity Federation, which means that your web applications like Facebook and Amazon, LinkedIn, and all of this can take advantage of passing information from their applications to the corporate applications. That's all fine and good, but we're wanting to go to the cloud. You say, you're going to make me set up a new set of, of uh, identity, authorization, authentication? No. The cloud has its own identity access management, and it ties in to the various type of federated uh, identity management that you have at your own organization. That's great. OK. Let's talk a little bit about two-factor authentication. Hopefully, we'll be able to get the speaker that the Cloud Security Alliance had down in Atlanta, at, in Tampa, last week. A very interesting topic. 12 ways to hack two-factor authentication. Having said that, he did add the caveat. Even though it can be hacked, choice between no two-factor authentication or multi-factor authentication and having it, better to have it. So in general, we talk about the idea Multi-factor meaning something that you know, your password, something that you have, which I'm sure a lot of you use 
a device on your mobile phone or whatever. It gives you these cute little six digit codes. When you're trying to log in, you have to put in this code that is provided by your uh, mobile phone app. We won't go into the mechanics of that, but that in and of itself is very interesting. So if you have those two together, that is two-factor authentication. Important to know here that a cloud service require, a cloud service provider may actually require the use of two-factor authentication for root administrators, despite its potential for not being a perfect control. What IT control is perfect? None of them. And the third aspect would be something that you are, such as your uh, the, the new thing in uh, with with mobile uh, sign-on. You have face recognition. You have the use of your fingerprint. I, I can't use it because. My fingers are too big. The, uh, <clears throat> the software, the, uh, the actual device, it's made for most people, and I'm not most people. I'm a big guy. Uh, also, we're talking about retinal scans and things like that. And it's the, in, in the cloud required for root administrators, but for other users, it is available. Contingency planning is something that has been totally changed, totally revolutionized, a new paradigm in the cloud. I think back 20 years ago as an IT auditor, and the things that I was requiring or, or recommending highly to my clients about um, the contingency planning and those things have become so much different in the cloud. We'll be talking about some terms. I'm just introducing it now, so I won't fully explain it, but I will later. Durability, data life cycle. These are things that are improvements in the cloud. Achieving your recovery point objectives. Fault tolerance and availability. A lot of the people use these terms interchangeably. We'll explain what the differences are. Things that contribute to fault tolerance and availability are redundancy and load balancing, geographic dispersion of being far away from uh, the other sites. And <laughs> there's a very interesting thing, if you're not familiar with it, it's going to be very interesting. Auto scaling, and we'll explain why auto scaling really becomes a uh, fault tolerance availability issue. And one that's going to really blow your mind away is what's available from disaster testing. Okay, we use the term 11 nines durability. It's like, not everybody has heard of that. So what exactly does that mean? That is an amazing percentage. Under a service level agreement, it's going to say that certain pieces of hardware, like a hard drive, have 11 nines durability. So it's, it's 99, that's two of them, and another nine nines behind the decimal point. So what does that mean? That means out of every 100 million records or reads that are done, one is going to fail. 100 billion. 100, oh. Who, uh, as Dr. Evil would say, who would want to have a billion when they could have a million? <laughs> 100 billion. Thank you for, for bringing that out. Now, if you were uh, 
an IT CIO and a rep came to you and said, I can deliver 11.9 durability, you'd be happy? Yes? Now it's in a service level agreement. Okay, before we talk about achieving recovery point objective, I wanna make sure everybody understands exactly what we mean by a recovery point objective. Our scale here is over time. And the recovery point objective is in relationship to the disaster. And as time is moving uh, to our right, the recovery point objective is before the disaster. So we say in this instance, we want a recovery point objective of three hours. What that means is if we have a disaster, we want to have data that is no more than three hours old. And as an IT manager, you say, okay, I'll try to do that. But in the cloud, you say, I can do that. Because every three hours, you'll take a snapshot of your data. And so you are actually guaranteeing a recovery point objective of three hours because every three hours you're taking another snapshot. And the first thing you think is, wow, you're taking a snapshot. It would be a performance hit, right? Not really. It's absolutely amazing what can be done in the cloud. Okay. I was mentioning before about data life cycle. In the data life cycle, we always have production storage, what's being used to run our business at a point in time. There are some things that we don't need to access quite as frequently, so let's just call that infrequent access storage. And then in the end, we'll move it to archival storage. This is logical. Unfortunately, archival storage typically means that you take data tapes and you send it off to a place maybe 100 miles away. If a disaster comes, then you, you call that place that's 100 miles away, send that data back to me. And they'll have to find the, the tapes, pack them up, schedule them to be delivered, and then you go to restore them. If anyone has gone through this process, they'll find that it takes days, typically, to access your archival storage, not in the cloud. The first thing I want to point out here is that the data lifecycle management is automated, so that when data gets to whatever you, you say, well, it's now six weeks old. I don't need to access it quite as frequently. Then you put it in infrequent access storage. Now, once it's six months old or one year old, we're gonna put it into archive. Here in the cloud where we're not talking about the, the uh, tapes, we're talking about the fact that it is held virtually somewhere, but as far as turnaround, we're talking about several hours. And I think anybody who's, who's been in the business for very long is sitting there saying, wow, that's amazing. Okay, fault tolerance. I read a definition, I didn't really like it, so I sort of altered it to, to make it what I, what I believe, what I have found fault tolerance defined as. Minimal or no disruptions when you have a hardware or software failure. Does that sound reasonable for fault tolerance? The idea is a fault is a failure of some component of your system. And you wanna make sure that when you have either a hardware or a software failure, your business is not disrupted or it's 
disrupted for as minimum of time as possible, which enables availability. Users can access data or IT resources with minimal delay where they are in a correct format. So that's all nice. Once again, we're in the, the we're the CIO, we're having a vendor come to us and we're gonna say, by service level agreement, we are going to guarantee you 99.99% availability. I'm seeing a shaking a head out here. Is that out of disbelief? You you would you would like to see uh, a higher higher ratio. Five nines. Five nines. And you can. This is the the standard availability that comes, which is one hour, less than one hour per year at 99.99%. We're going to go through a progression about availability. At the lowest rung of this scale, we're going to have simple redundancy, where we're showing whether it be a server or a database, we have a production instance and we're going to replicate it up to a standby instance so that if the production instance goes down, you can revert to the standby instance. That's nice, that's good. But typically, we're talking about maybe there be a standby server right next to the server, the production server, that's nice. But if we go to the next level, we're gonna talk about having load balancing where both of the servers are in production and the load balancer is going to split the, uh, the load, the uh, processing that's coming in between the two servers or between the two databases. And that way, uh, it helps reduce latency and it helps make sure that one of the instances does not get too high of utilization, it's balancing it out. And instead of a one-way synchronization, we're gonna have synchronization both ways because these are both in production. And this can be nice because if you have a, a failure of one component, it is the, the second component, the Instance two is being kept up to date, so when you fail over to the second instance, you may have a, a seamless experience with your customers. But I'm gonna ratchet that up a, a bit. This is the same scenario that we just had. Instead of a standard load balancer, this is gonna be a fault tolerant load balancer. And let's explain what that does. We have our instance one went down. The fault tolerant load balancer detects that and immediately cuts all transmissions to it and stops the replication. To me, this is the amazing part that the fault tolerant load balancer is going to automatically launch another server as a replacement. And then it's gonna start replicating with the production server that's working. And once that is synchronized, then it's going to start load balancing between the instance two and the new instance. This is Wonderful. This is definitely a step forward from what I just described to you. Now, what we see is if you didn't have this advanced capability, your users would be sitting there very frustrated saying not nice things about the people in IT. But instead, 
They're doing their work. They didn't know anything happened. So, therefore, the fault was unnoticed and seamless to the user. I'm still not happy. I'm going to ratchet it up one more time. I'm going to say, I've got my fault tolerant load balancer, but I'm going to make sure that it's in two different zones. Between it, I'll have a long distance connection. Let me illustrate that further. I live in Tampa, and I've done very well for myself, so I'm going to open a cloud data center in Tampa. And I say, well, I'm going to set up one pretty far away, Atlanta. I'm going to put a high-speed, uh, long-distance uh, connection between the two. I'll make it redundant. OK. Now, from people throughout the United States and throughout the world who are watching this may not know, Tampa is the lightning capital of the world. There are 700,000 lightning strikes per year in the Tampa Bay area. But that's not what I'm trying to illustrate here. What I'm trying to illustrate is that clearly Tampa and Atlanta are in different power grids. So if the power grid goes down, uh, it should not spread to Atlanta. I, 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 I saw the worst case scenario, the, the disaster that was about uh, 2002, where the Ohio power, the Northeast Ohio power grid went down and it, it spread to Canada, over into New York and all that. We won't talk about that, but at least we're improving in this and faults of the power grid should be contained to a single power grid nowadays. Being in Atlanta and Tampa, this is, uh, eight hours drive, almost 500 miles. One disaster should not affect both facilities, which is by definition the, uh, the definition of what is fault tolerant and available. I'm going to tell you that this, this connection between Atlanta and Tampa is high speed and high bandwidth. So you're not going to have problems with latency. What I'm going to be describing here is a fairly typical thing that goes on in IT. You have a certain level of capacity, and below it, your, your capacity is fluctuating. You anticipate that it's going to go up, so you increase your capacity. And then that happens again, you increase it again. But if we look at the last tier there, we have a problem. If your actual demand exceeds your capacity, what's going to happen? Boom, your system's going to go down. Not a desirable thing. So we have in the cloud this concept of auto scaling. And you're, you have a certain comfort zone, which you're operating in right now, where you're keeping the current capacity. But you've decided that you can change these parameters, but you've decided, for the time being, that 70% of the current capacity, when you have that for 20 minutes, you're going to increase the capacity by a certain level. And, or if the current capacity, you're only using 40% of it, now you can Reduce your resources, reduce your instances, and that's wonderful. But what's even more wonderful and amazing, this is a fairly, a fairly, uh, this graph is showing something that typically happens at a lot of companies. Within the day, a lot of fluctuation. Sometimes, you know, very low volume, uh, Maybe right before lunch, the, the demand goes up. So you can actually auto scale within the day, which is absolutely amazing. Uh, I did ask the question at one of the 
AWS training, you have to understand AWS is owned by Amazon, but they have two separate computing systems. And I was going to ask them, what happened to your auto scaling on Prime Day when the, the volume was higher than you anticipated and, and your machines crashed for several hours? I want to keep my job. I'm not going to answer that question. But theoretically, the way they describe it is the auto scaling is virtually, virtually infinite. You can auto scale as large as, as large as necessary, and you can do that because of the economies of scale. Okay, let's talk about real time disaster planning. Great idea, huh? The idea here is we have our fault tolerant load balance. We are going to purposely shut down one of our production instances and we're going to allow this process to carry out just like we described before. The important thing is we're doing this on purpose. And to give you an example, Netflix does this on a regular basis. Randomly, they'll take a certain resource and cause a fault in it and see what happens, whether they stay online. Uh, I haven't talked about physical security, but let me just tell you that in the cloud, the physical security is all taken care of by the CSP. It'd be comparable. All right, some basic concepts on cost. In the cloud, you're generally talking about variable pricing, about the more resources that you use, you'll, you'll get charged more. If you stop using them, you'll stop paying for them. And that is very attractive versus the idea of capital expenditures. Auto scaling and capacity planning. I just talked about auto scaling, but I remember many of my clients were, many of my consulting clients, the idea of capacity planning was all this horrible theoretical exercise. In this year's budget, how much capacity are we gonna add? Not an issue here with the auto scaling. So that becomes a cost issue. These cloud uh, service providers are massive organizations. And because of their economies of scale, you can lower the price. A company could never do this with an in-house data center. Global reach, uh, the, the part of global reach that doesn't quite work, AWS is opening the first Mideast data center next year, and Microsoft is soon behind. There are no cloud data centers in Africa, uh, though Microsoft has uh, the edge uh, servers there, which we'll talk about shortly. You're able to reduce an enormous number of IT vendors that you have to deal with because they're all within the stacks that are managed by the cloud service provider. You, instead of having this specialized talent in-house, you're in effect in outsourcing it and because of the economies of scale, the cloud service provider can hand handle that. Managed services <laughs> carry things a lot farther. The cloud service provider is managing <coughs> virtually the entire stack for you. Not literally a software as a service, but it gets awfully close there. If, you're, if you have your data center and you can't quite get rid of it now, a lot of places are using cloud bursting, which says that when the capacity gets very high, then they burst into the cloud and use the auto scaling up there. Uh, development platforms, uh, really, you can fire one up, take it down. It's amazing. Agility, as this dog shows, agility not only means going fast, but it also means maneuvering. It's amazing how quickly you can go 
to new markets with the cloud. Uh, you know, sometimes companies are told, well, I, I want to implement this, I want to go to this market. They say, well, it'll take two years to implement that. Well, in the IT terms, two years isn't a time enough for technology to change. The same concept applies to new applications and migrations. I heard an amazing presentation last month for a Tampa-based company, Tampa Bay-based company called Malwarebytes. Been around for two years. They are a anti-malware software company. In two years, they've made three, ma three major changes to their architecture. They've totally redone the architecture three times in two years. Can't really do that unless you're in the cloud. The idea of, redu of reducing latency, I bring up the idea of flexible specifications so you can choose, for instance, I want a, this is normal, I want a low latency, this is the priority. Do I want that or low or high memory usage? You can choose resources that will affect your agility and your ability to reduce latency. Direct connections are another way to reduce latency. There are supercomputing, which is almost impossible to do without the cloud. Edge servers uh, is for, for instance, if you have video content, that you're trying to get all around the country or all around the world, you put that content on an edge server, which its job is to deliver the content. That's it. It's very useful for help delivering it. Uh, we uh, Amazing advanced capabilities that would be virtually very costly and, and very difficult for companies to carry out machine learning, deep learning, artificial intelligence, supercomputing, big data, data lakes, uh, very agile move to mobile equipment, advanced analytics, predictive analytics, and even real-time analytics. When you have industrial companies that are putting devices all over their plants, all over their company, it, industrial internet of things. Well, you're gonna need the cloud for that. We talk about the shared responsibility model. This is uh, Microsoft, just to illustrate how it's different in different companies. When you're on-premise, you're responsible for the entire stack. When you have, inter, uh, you have the infrastructure as a service, then, you know, you uh, have moved many of the stack over to the cloud service provider. The platform as a service is useful for your DevOps, and everyone has been used to software as a service when we talk about Microsoft Office 365 or uh, Google Plus and all these type of things. There's two aspects of it being shared. One is part of the responsibility is yours as a client. Part of it is at the internet service provider. There are some areas here that have both. For instance, if you're talking about network controls in the infrastructure as a service, then that is shared. Some of it is with the client. Some of it is with the CSP. This is from AWS. If you look at it carefully, you'll find network issues that are both, this is as an inf infrastructure as a service, network issues that are responsible of a AWS and some of them that are a responsibility of the customer. The Google one, I really have to talk to someone at Google because some of this doesn't make sense to me. Uh, when, it, when it says that an infrastructure is a service, they're gonna be responsible 
for operating systems data and content. I don't see that at all. You really need to talk to your internet service provider and make sure you understand it. They're responsible for some things, you're responsible for the other. But what you really have to take a look is the total system. Theirs, yours, and how they interact with each other. So who has the ultimate responsibility for cloud service providers' security and control? Is it the cloud service provider? Is it the client? Well, actually it's the client. If you're having a problem, if your cloud service provider creates a problem for you and uh, it causes your own services to go down, so you tell, you have your PR person come out and say, it was the cloud service provider's problem. Do your customers want to hear that? I don't think so. So uh, both in terms of a realistic business sense and from a, uh, a legal sense and a accounting sense, you have responsibility even if the cloud says it's responsible. In the end, the client is ultimately responsible. The question is, should you implement best practices? Best practices to me means best in the whole world. And when you have that level of controls, it's very expensive. So I recommend using risk management so that uh, you can make these decisions intelligently. How do you trust your cloud service provider? One of the reports you can get from your cloud service provider is called the CSA STAR report, and it is sponsored in conjunction with the Cloud uh, Security Alliance and the British Standards Institute. And they have, the, the CSA has the only framework for the cloud called the Cloud Controls Matrix. They use that in conjunction with a couple other documents to do the assessments, and you can get the report from an independent assessor telling you how good the controls are there. That is an assessment. There are also audit reports, and the AICPA, the Association of International CPAs, has a standard. These audits are carried out by CPAs. There's three levels of them. I won't get into the details. I'll just tell you, the first one isn't really good because it just deals with controls over financial reporting not comprehensive enough. The bottom one is too general because it's available to everyone. What you really want to see is the level two, which has a lot of detail. And if you combine the level two with CSA star, you have a SOC two CSA star report. It uses everything from the star plus the AICPA's trust service criteria, this is really the best. I'd like to tell you, if you want to learn more about this little bonus, uh, CompTIA offers two cloud certifications, one of them called Cloud Essentials, which it often recommends for management, and Cloud Plus gets you really a pretty pretty decent understanding of the cloud. ISC Squared has, similar to the Cloud Plus, they have the Certified Cloud Security Professional, and the CSA has the Certificate of Cloud Security Knowledge. So if you're wanting to go further, these are the ones you need as far as generic cloud information, but each of the Cloud service providers has their own as well. So you can go as far as you want with this. It can get really complicated. But the important thing is your company needs to have awareness of the cloud. They have to have knowledge and skills if you're going to implement the cloud 
That's the bottom line. Because virtually every cloud architecture decision that you make will have some form of security and control implications. I'd like to thank you for your patience because I know I went over. Don's been sitting here with the mic microphone for quite a while. This is my contact information. I encourage you, you can call me or contact me with questions that you might have. Excellent presentation, Martin. I really appreciate you coming up here and speaking. I know the group appreciates it as well as, as, well as everybody online. I do want to open up the floor for questions, though. I know Great. a couple of people looked like they had a, the inquisitive look on their face. Terrific. We're going to go around and ask those, but I do want to remind everybody out there in TV land, uh, if you want to learn more about Martin and his services, you can check them out. Uh, the website is www.consultantc.services. Or if you say it quickly, Consultant C. It's almost like you did that on purpose. <laughs> May have been. <laughs> All right. Well, let's reach out to the group here. Uh, does anybody have any questions? I noticed that you had chosen Atlanta as a backup for Tampa on the concept that they're far enough apart that, you know, one uh, uh, damage in one probably wouldn't hurt uh, the other, in which case the tropical season looks at you and says, hold, hold my frosty adult beverage. Um, right. What are the implications in moving it further away? Are there latency implications? Are there implications if you cross state or national borders? Why, how do you, what's the best way to choose where you want your co-location to be? Well, it's important to realize that every region has two or more zones, uh, usually three or more zones. So there is no latency consideration because there's high speed, high bandwidth connections between the, uh, the data centers within the zones. And to tell you the truth, the service providers won't tell you for security reasons where exactly they are, but they will tell you that they're not in the same power grid and one disaster is not likely to affect both. If you start going in a region, that's possible too. On the cloud, anything is possible for, for a price. And uh, still between the regions, you'll still have these these great connections. So you won't be losing from that perspective, enabling you to match your footprint globally of your business with the cloud. And with all of those different connections, with them all being synchronized, then your disaster contingency planning becomes amazingly uh, fault tolerant. All right, who'd like to go next? Who is the actual owner of the data that's on a server that's hosted by a service provider? That's a very, that's a very good question. Because data in all three models of uh, the IAAS, the PaaS, and the SAS, all of that is in the, the client realm, then the client is responsible for the data. The client owns the data. So it remains yours. But what has become a concern, I, I sort of see where you're going with this, it becoming a concern is, is what they call lock-in, where you feel like you've, you've gotten integrated to all these different services with your CSP. You say, oh my God, with all the work I've done, it's going to be very hard to move to another cloud service provider. Supposedly, this lock-in uh, has become less. The other side of that coin is lock out, which means what happens if the cloud service provider goes out of business? And you'll have to look at the contract to make sure that, for instance, all of the uh, unique programs that they have are held in escrow and exactly how that process is handled as far as accessing uh, 
all your infrastructure on the cloud and be able to port it over to another. Absolutely. Um, the, reason, the reason why I'm asking is because of an experience I had with a person that I assist like three years ago. They had a cloud service provider, and I don't remember who it was. And he, his data was on a virtual machine, probably with several virtual machines. And one of the other people that were having their uh, stuff in the uh, cloud. Another another client yeah, had their out. own virtual machines. Yeah, but, but and, and, and there's supposed to be this wall that. in between the different clients. Let me, let me so if you're one asking. client, the, the other client can ask you. Okay, go ahead. Okay, there was another client doing an entirely different business, which turned out to be illegal. One day, this is what the service providers told him. They said, Department of Treasury, took the server and left with it. And, and, and he said, well, where's my data? And, he's there, and they're like, well, we're, we're gonna see what we can do. <laughs> well, uh, Now, yeah. what could he have done to prevent that from happening? Or I'm just saying. Well, well the fact that you, you have your, uh, your data replicated in different zones and maybe different regions means that if one or more of the servers is removed, you will still have the availability from another zone, another region, and then they'll be able to quickly build another server for you. This, this is what you call, uh, what you create is, is like a snapshot. It's an uh, automated machine image, and they'll be able to take it very quickly it's not just the software, it's the entire infrastructure. The snapshot of how you want things configured, the exact hardware, the exact software, the automatic machine image is restored in an, at another server and the disruption should be minimal. You right, still have a skeptical yeah. look on your face. <laughs> well, I just know it took like two weeks before. It took almost two weeks before his data was back. And how long ago was this? Oh, this is like three years ago. Yeah, I the things are progressing so much in the cloud. The number of services offered by all of them is growing astronomically. As the size keeps growing, the prices over time are actually going down. Everything is improving so rapidly in the cloud. I don't want to oversell it, uh, but seriously, it is something to to look at very seriously. Sure. Do you, are there any assurances that the provider of your cloud services will not mine your data? Uh, this is a, a contractual issue. And also, you have to understand the way these virtual machines are set up, the fact that, that they have control of the lower stacks their people cannot touch what's inside the virtual machine. So it, it should be theoretically impossible for them to go into your data and see anything. And how do you know that's the case? It's because of these assessment and more importantly audit reports that verify that these controls are in place and effective. All right, Martin, I, I wanted to stick in one question that, uh, that I get a lot, so I want to see what your answer is. Sure. People are constantly asking me, you know, there's a couple of big cloud providers right now. Most people end up with either, you mentioned Amazon AWS, we have Microsoft Azure, Google Cloud. Those are the three big players. Who's your favorite? I don't think that you can have one as your favorite. What you have to do, like, you know, some, sometimes a lot of IT decisions are, are made based on the company's reputation or how well the company's name is known. Through IT, you always have to go through the same process. Start with developing your requirements. Your requirements drive the specifications. You get the proposals from the various ones and make the decision. What might be the 
the right cloud server a pro, a service provider for you may not be the same as someone down the street. And it doesn't mean that the, it may be the only one. I was talking to a gentleman from a major company at one of the user group meetings. They said, well, we use this service provider in general, but we use Microsoft because Microsoft handles our Office 365, SharePoint, Exchange Server, and everything like that. So you can end up in the situation where you have multiple cloud service providers. Excellent. Well, Martin, I want to thank you again for presenting and, and thank you from the rest of the crowd. Let's give a big round of applause for Martin. Thank you very much. All right, and I just want to send a quick message out to everybody that is there. I mean, first off, for those of you that are here in the building with us, thank you all for attending. Uh, a reminder to everybody else that's watching online, you're always welcome to join us at the local chapter meetings. They're posted right on the website. We have one every single month. You can check out the North Central Florida chapter of the AITP's website to find when the next presentation is. I do encourage you, if you're not already, to consider joining the AITP, become a member, and you'll get access to great presentations like the one that Martin just gave, as well as a chance to network and communicate with other people that are in the chapter and in the local community. It's a great way to meet people and learn new things. Definitely Martin, agree. And, and you've certainly given us a, a lot of food for thought after this presentation. There's, there's so much. This is uh, like the appetizer. And if you want to know more, like I said, there are those professional certifications. That's a great way to gain more knowledge. All right, and then my final reminder for the night is, uh, like I mentioned before, it is election season coming up for our chapter. So if you're interested in running for an office here in the uh, local chapter, be sure to submit your nomination. We'll get you in there, uh, and elections will be happening in the, the next couple of months. So definitely keep an eye out for that. All right, well, everybody, thank you for watching. Have a good night from the North Central Florida chapter of the AIT. Thank you as well.